The very split from nature that some Christian theologians claim occurred in the Garden of Eden may lie at the heart of many people's current sense of separateness from their ecology. And this was the message of Mark's first poem, which reminded me of Allen Ginsberg's howl. This is like a howl for the environment. Aldous Huxley witnessed this reunion through his experimental use as a vesco. He said, I was seeing what Adam had seen on the morning of creation, the miracle moment by moment of naked existence. Albert Hoffman retorted that he had a mystical nature experience when he was young, and this prefigured his discovery of LSD. When I was at his 100th birthday party, he talked about how he didn't discover LSD, LSD discovered him. <laughs> and I was slated to be the next commentator, and I said, Albert, that couldn't have discovered a better person. <laughs> <laughs> Albert was very, always very, very modest about his, his discovery. Robert Masters and Gene Houston noted that nature seems to be the subject, a whole of which he or she is an integral part, and from this characteristic feeling of being a part of the organic body of nature, the LSD subject readily goes on to identify with nature and its physical particulars and processes. And I gave an endorsement of their marvelous classical book, The Varieties of Psychedelic Experience, yesterday. And as you read that, all these decades later, you can see how often the subjects refer to their contact with nature and how this is one of the long-lasting effects. Unfortunately, Robert Masters is no longer with us either, but Gene is going strong. And Gene has been um, working with indigenous people through the United Nations, helping them to reconnect with their mythology, reconnect with their, with their traditions, and um, and has had great success and great receptivity in this work. The shaman is a caretaker of nature and a negotiator between people and other than human persons, as Graham Harvey called them in his 2005 Animus Manifesto. <laughs> Paul Simmons speculated that mushrooms have a hidden agenda to bring humans into communication with other species. And, according to um, um, the model that you discussed with us earlier, they might have had something to do with the whole evolution of the human nervous system. A survey of people's exceptional experiences with psychedelics, one of many, found that encountering the spirit of the ingested plant or fungus was the most widely reported of a range of 17 paranormal and transpersonal type experiences occurring with those taking psilocybin containing <coughs> mushrooms. And Elector warned that these experiences largely were ignored or are seen as symptoms of madness. Well, of course they're seen as symptoms of madness because to be close to nature is seen as a dissolution of the ego boundaries and a oneness with nature is seen as a form of psychosis, and thank heavens that we now have, thanks to David Lukoff and his team, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, a category for religious and spiritual disorders, so that people can get legitimate treatment if they don't know what to make of these spiritual emergencies. What is more mad, communicating with the spirits of nature or sitting back while Earth's ecology descends rapidly into the greatest wave of mass extension in 65 billion years. And as Ian mentioned, the people who were in Scandinavia who were making these predictions now think their predictions are too conservative. You know that shamans have most likely been communicating with nature this way for thousands of years. It might well be asked what can be gained for humanity's relationship with the ecosystem from such a dialogue. And more important, how can nature benefit from this relationship? This is a question posed by Paul Devereaux in his latest book. The question is of central importance to ecological psychologists who attempt to understand behavioral and experiential processes as they occur within the environmental constraints of animal environmental systems. Paul Devereaux and I did a simple experiment, not so simple for the volunteers, they went out and slept in sacred places in England and Wales. And they had a 
companion who watched the Raphonai movements woke them up and recorded their dreams. And the dreams they had in the sacred places were significantly different than their dreams at home in their comfortable bed. Maybe just because they were cold and there were a lot of rocks <laughs> in the sacred places. But not necessarily if you read the accounts, you get a lot of the same types of oneness with nature experiences that you have gotten in these LSD and psilocybin and mushroom reports. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the latest Alex Gray book. Nice. You all recognize the subject if you don't know who Alex Gray is. He is now the leading visionary artist in the United States. And he did a beautiful portrait of Albert Hoffman for Albert's 100th birthday party. Psychedelic sensibility can play an important role in helping humans devote their efforts to attaining ecological sustainability before the time runs out and nature's clock runs, run, winds down. So, here we have it. Is this <laughs> the twilight of the gods for all of us? Or will we wake up and reclaim our bond with nature? And that's the bridge that we are talking about, that is the bridge referred to in this marvelous conference that SAC is sponsored this weekend. Thank you.